I'll present first the process of how we did and we come up with the recommendation. Before that, this is the scope of the guideline. The, mo the main focus here is the diagnosis and management of sexually transmitted diseases. And this guideline will cover three aspects of management. First is diagnostic, second is treatment, and then prevention. The disease that will be covered here, we base it on the most clinical or most common clinical present presentation, which is syndromic approach. Like, for example, genital ulcer, cervical and urethral discharge, vaginal discharge, and wart. So the focus of the discussion and the treatment, diagnostic, and prevention will focus on this four syndromic approach. The target population here is our adults 19 and above, including pregnant population and those people living with HIV. The involved societies here are PSMID, ob Infectious Disease Society, Urology, Family Med, including government uh, representative from the Department of Health. And the main intended user of these clinical guidelines are all physicians, ranging from the ID specialist, internist, STD clinic physicians, PAMED, venereologists, primary health care physicians, urologists, OB surgeons, dermatologists, and other health care workers. So this is the panel. We have the steering committee uh, and composed of Dr. Panaligan, the present uh, PSMID president, and uh, the Department of Health, represented by Dr. Lynn Vianson, the head of the infectious disease uh, department of the Department of Health and uh, part of the process we will also be in inviting expert panel to review the recommendation and these are represented by different sectors from the Department of Health, WHO, ob uh, officers of the Philippine Society for Venereology and, Inf and Infections, Urology and Family Physicians. The technical working group this is chaired by Dr. Uh, Marie Rosa de los Reyes, and the subgroup chairs are Dr. Solante, Dr. Bensalido, Dr. Neri Siscon, and Dr. Malu Villa for the respective syndromes. These are the complete members of each of the subgroup and uh, the other subgroups. If you look at the anatomy of this clinical practice guideline, this will be the composition. You have the introduction, the issues that we raise during the meeting, the statement of the guideline, or the recommendation, the summary of evidence, and the strength of recommendation. Before we did the recommendation, we did this process. We reviewed the guideline that are existing for sexually transmitted infection using the ADAPTE process. Okay, and so this is the, how the process was uh, evaluated, how each guideline was evaluated, which among those guidelines more or less are, uh, has the same uh, indication or has the same makeup in terms of population or target population as that with the Philippines. So a group composed of uh, 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 members of each of the uh, syndrome did review of each of these guidelines using this uh, uh, adaptive process. Okay, and then this is the initial literature search of the articles, or if not the guideline. And these were the criteria for inclusion. So it's usually an STD in the clinic or community setting, published online. English only, and the other criteria. If there is a duplicate of the guideline, we consider the most recent or the most current of the guideline. We did not include special population that includes those individuals in prison and pediatric uh, population. Okay, so this is just an example of how the group came up with the different uh, questions. Okay. So this is for the anode, genital, and oral uh, ulcers, cervicitis and vaginitis, genital wards, 
and the genital ulcers. Now for this afternoon, since the group was not able to finish the, all the three important uh, part of the guideline, we were able to finish only the treatment part. The diagnostics and prevention are still in the process and hopefully by next year's convention, we'll be able to give you a handout of the complete uh, uh, guideline or content of the guideline. So for this afternoon, we'll just be presenting the treatment part of the four syndromic uh, clinical presentation of sexually transmitted infection. Now I will call the first presenter, which, which will represent the genital ulcer group. And this will be Dr. Daisy Tagarda. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to um, present to you the uh, treatment guideline on genital ulcer, including the syphilis and the herpes simplex virus. So I'm going to cover and try to answer the following questions. First question regarding genital ulcer, what are the recommended treatment for primary, secondary, and early latent syphilis? So we recommend the standard treatment to give benzathine penicillin G 2.4 million units via intramuscular route type for one dose only with a um, strong recommendation and very low quality of evidence. Recommendation of treatment for late syphilis or syphilis of unknown duration, we recommend benzathine penicillin G 2.4 million units via intramuscular route weekly for three consecutive weeks with strong recommendation, very low quality of evidence. So we decided to group the syphilis into early syphilis, which is consists of primary, secondary, or latent syphilis of no more than two years duration. We adopted the WHO 2016 guideline and late syphilis in a, is an infection of more than two years without evidence of treponemal infection. The recommended treatment for neurosyphilis or ocular syphilis, we recommend to give aqueous crystalline penicillin G, 18 to 24 million units per day administered as three to four million units via intravenous route every four hours or as continuous infusion for 10 to 14 days with strong recommendation with very low quality of evidence. We all know that neurosyphilis is considered as a complication of untreated syphilis, but can occur at early stages or any stages of syphilis, which can present with um, infectious arteritis and can result into stroke, general paresis, and tabis dorsalis. For our recommendation of treatment for first episode of herpes simplex for immunocompetent patients, we recommend to give acyclovir for the following doses or valacyclovir, 500 milligram twice a day for 10 days. It has been uh, recommended in the WHO that um, due to poor follow-up of the patients with genital ulcer, they recommend to give it for 10 days. So comparing the acyclovir versus uh, uh, valacyclovir, there is non-inferiority um, as compared by uh, acyclovir as to acyclovir. The duration and symptoms and lesion probably reduced by two to four days with acyclovir as compared to the placebo, pain reduced by two more days, and duration of viral shedding reduced by nine more days. For the treatment of recurrent genital and anal ulcers, we recommend treatment for episodic herpes simplex infection with the following medications, acyclovir, these are our recommended doses, or valacyclovir. 
Episodic herpes simplex is defined as any recurrence of herpes after the first episode. So we have uh, several evidences showing that uh, the treatment with valacyclovir and acyclovir actually reduce the duration of treatment and symptoms and lesion. Okay. acyclovir is not available in our country, hence we did not recommend as part of the treatment. Treatment of um, recurrent genital ulcer for suppressive therapy and duration. We recommend to give acyclovir 400 milligrams three times a day for the duration of six to 12 months or valacyclovir. So if you have um, recurrences of fewer than 10 per year, then you can give only 500 milligram daily for six to 12 months. Or if you have more than 10 recurrences per year, you can give or increase the dose of valacyclovir to one gram once a day for six to 12 months. Let's now go to the next question. How do you monitor response to treatment? So we recommend treatment monitoring for syphilis. Um, we assess the resolution of the lesions. However, we also recommend serologic titer using your RPR and not your uh, treponamol test to monitor treatment response. It should be done as baseline at six months and 12 months after the treatment. For monitoring of herpes simplex virus, we recommend to monitor by assessing the resolution of symptoms with moderate recommendation and low quality of evidence. The recommended and alternative treatment for genital and anal ulcers uh, in special hosts, including our patients with HIV and pregnant patients. So for our HIV patients with first episode of HSV, we recommend to give a cyclovir, this time higher dose as compared to uh, immunocompetent individuals at 400 milligram five times a day for 10 days, or valacyclovir at one gram two times a day for 10 days. For patients who have severe mucocutaneous herpes simplex, herpes simplex virus, we recommend to give intravenous acyclovir and should be continued until the lesions are healed. On the on treatment of HIV patients with recurrent um, genital ulcer for HSV, for episodic therapy, again, we have a higher dose as compared to immunocompetent patients. We recommend to give acyclovir 400 milligram five ta uh, three times a day for 10 days and valacyclovir one gram twice a day for 10 days. For suppressive therapy, we recommend treatment also of acyclovir and valacyclovir with the following doses. For treatment of pregnant patients for suppressive therapy for HSV, we also recommend treatment of acyclovir to start at 36 weeks of age of gestation, and we recommend cesarean delivery for women with genital herpes uh, prodrome. It has a weak recommendation with very low quality of evidence. For the treatment of HIV patients with early syphilis, the, usual, the treatment will be as the same with immunocompetent patients with benzatine penicillin G, 2.4 million units intramuscular for only one dose, and treatment of late syphilis, of syphilis of unknown duration, we also recommend to give benzidine penicillin G once weekly for three doses. No treatment regimen for syphilis has been known to be more effective among HIV patients, but we'd like to stress the importance of use of the antiretroviral therapy to improve the outcomes of persons with HIV infection and syphilis. So for treatment recommendation for pregnant patients with early syphilis, this is uh, the same recommendation with immunocompetent patients or uh, not special uh, population. However, for um, alternative uh, treatment for those patients who suffered adverse drug reactions secondary to the standard treatment, we recommend alternative treatment of doxycycline. These are for non-pregnant patients. 100 milligram orally twice daily for 14 days or ceftriaxone one to two grams daily either IM or intramuscular or intravenous for 10 to 14 days. For um, non-pregnant patients who have latent syphilis, we recommend to give doxycycline 100 milligrams orally twice daily for an extended period of 28 days. 
So for patients who are known to be allergic to penicillin with questionable compliance or follow-up, we recommend desensitization and should be given benzatine penicillin with the recommended doses. Um, for your patients who are pregnant, remember doxycycline is uh, contraindicated among patients who are pregnant. Um, we recommend to give erythromycin 500 milligrams orally four times a day for 14 days. These are for the population wherein the sensitization cannot be tolerated by the patient. This should be given cautiously to these patients. Or ceftriaxone one gram intramuscular once a day for 10 to 14 days. For uh, pregnant women, with, uh, who are known to, be ha to have a late syphilis or desensitization is not possible. You can again give erythromycin 500 milligrams four times daily for extended period of time for 30 days. So let's now go to the management of the sexual partner. We recommend that if the sexual partner is symptomatic, it should be evaluated and treated in the same manner as the patients who have genital ulcer. If asymptomatic, there should be uh, work up and even um, including the screening for other STIs, especially for HIV, then should be offered for both patient and partner. So for syphilis, for those patients who are exposed within 90 days, so if their sexual par partner has been exposed within 90 days, you should give treatment for early syphilis even without serologic tests or even the serologic tests are negative. However, if the sexual contact of more than 90 days before the diagnosis of primary syphilis, you should work up the patient first. But in cases of you cannot work up the patient, you can give the presumptive treatment for early syphilis. If serologic tests are negative, therefore you, you, know, you need not give treatment to the patients. These are our contributors. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Ratagarda. We will uh, entertain questions after the four presenters have uh, uh, presented. So let me just properly introduce the speakers. Uh, our first speaker, uh, Daisy Tagarda, is a medical specialist three from San Lazaro Hospital, a visiting consultant and head of the Antimicrobial Stewardship Committee from the University of Santo Tomas. Our second speaker who will talk on treatment for vaginitis is Dr. Maria Lourdes Villa. She is a consultant in internal medicine and infectious diseases in Lipa City, Batangas. She is a member of the specialty board of PSMID, the chair of the vaginitis group of the ST, STD uh, committee and a member of the cl uh, clinical practice guidelines on pneumonia. Our third speaker will talk on the treatment of uh, warts is Dr. Joseph Adrian Bensalido. He is uh, cha the chair of the Gentle Warts uh, Subcommittee of the STI uh, Clinical Practice Committee. He is the research committee member of the Department of Medicine University of the Philippines, Philippine General Hospital. He is the Pandemic Influenza and Emerging Disease Emergency Response Task Force member in Makati Medical Center, an infectious disease specialist in several uh, private hospitals, and uh, such as the Asian Hospital and Medical Center, Makati Medical Center, Manila Doctors Hospital, and also the Philippine General Hospital. And our fourth uh, speaker who will talk on urethritis and cervicitis treatment is Dr. Katerina Leritana. She is the Medical Director of Sustained Health Initiatives of the Philippines Incorporated, or SHIP. She's also the Medical Director of SHIP uh, Clinic. 
She's the consultant at St. Patrick's Health Care Systems and the United Doctors Medical Center, Manila. So may I now call on the next speaker, uh, Dr. Villa, and will be followed by Dr. Leritana and Dr. Ben Salido. Thank you. So good afternoon. Uh, today I'm tasked to, t to talk on the proposed treatment guidelines for diseases characterized by vaginal discharge, which will cover bacterial vaginosis, trachomoniasis, and candidiasis. So for bacterial vaginosis, what are the recommended treatment? So recommended treatment is metronidazole 500 milligrams orally BID for seven days with an alternative of clindamycin 300 milligrams orally BID for seven days or metronidazole two grams orally single dose. Uh, trials among um, non-pregnant women with bacterial vaginosis have been shown to have clindamycin and uh, metronidazole efficacy which are comparable in terms of eradication of symptoms irrespective of dosing regimens or route of administration. Um, in a um, review of uh, efficacy treatment trials by Kumans et al., efficacy of a seven-day metronidazole regimen was found to be at between 80 to 90 percent with the worst case relapse rates noted one month after therapy after a sensitivity analysis showing metronidazole uh, at 500 milligrams BID for seven days at 20 percent against two grams single dose uh, at 50 percent. So when do you monitor response to treatment for bacterial vaginosis? So follow-up is not necessary unless symptomatic or pregnant. If pregnant, Testing should be repeated after one month to ensure that therapy was effective and to assess if there is a need for retreatment. How should recurrent and persistent bacterial vaginosis be managed? So metronidazole 500 milligrams POBID for 10 to 14 days. Extending the course of therapy has been recommended to suppress abnormal growth of bacteria among those with documented recurrences. And this, the first option is to, do, is to give metronidazole 500 milligrams BID for 10 to 14 days. And uh, randomized control trials have, has, has also documented that 14 days was superior to seven day regimen by enhancing the cure rates for bacterial vaginosis. And a randomized trial by Swebke and Desmond on the duration of therapy with metronidazole uh, for the treatment of symptomatic bacterial vaginosis have, have shown that cure rates significantly improved with a 14-day regimen at the seven-day follow-up visit. However, cure rates were equal at 21-day follow-up visit, suggesting that relapse or reinfection had occurred. A hypothesis for failure of treatment benefit of 14 days of metronidazole to be sustained beyond first follow-up visit is that 70% of women participated in unprotected sex during the course of this study and were re-exposed to the causative agent. So what are the recommended treatment of bacterial vaginosis in pregnant women? So recommended is metronidazole, 500 milligrams orally, BID, for seven days. Alternative at metronidazole, two grams orally, single dose. So metronidazole is recommended as there is no evidence of teratogenicity from its use among women. Um, clindamycin is also a treatment in um, guidelines, in existing guidelines. However, the, the group ran across this um, uh, cohort study in Canada on the use of antibiotics during pregnancy with conclusion that clindamycin in utero exposure were linked 
to increase risk of organ-specific malformation, hence the group decided to look into this concern. So what are the recommended treatment in HIV persons? So women with HIV have been shown to respond has, has, has not been shown to respond differently to treatment for those with bacterial vaginosis than those without. Hence, the treatment for HIV is the same as for non-HIV people. How do you manage sexual partners of patients with bacterial vaginosis? So routine treatment of sexual partners is not recommended. A Cochrane systematic review on the antibiotic treatment for sexual partners of women with bacterial vaginosis comparing antibiotic treatment of sexual partners has shown that it does not increase the rate of, of clinical or symptomatic improvement into women, nor does it, it, does not, it does not lead to a lower recurrence rate into the women, uh, but increases the frequency of adverse events reported by sexual partners. Compared with no intervention, the same antibiotic treatment does not decrease the recurrence rate into the women. For trichomoniasis, uh, what are the recommended treatment? So recommended treatment is at metronidazole, 500 milligrams orally, BID, for seven days. An alternative is metronidazole, two grams orally in a single dose. Tinidazole is not locally available. So systemic antibiotic therapy is required, to effect, is required to effect a permanent cure due to the high frequency of infection of the urethra and pararethral glands among females. Oral single-dose treatment with any nitrimidazole seems to be effective in achieving short-term parasitological cure, but is associated with more frequent side effects than either longer oral or intravaginal treatment. Uh, a recent study uh, a recent open-label randomized controlled trial on the single dose versus seven-day dose metronidazole for the treatment of trichomoniasis in women showed that metronidazole 500 milligrams POBID for seven days were less likely to be trichomonas vaginalis positive at the test of cure than those among given two grams PO single dose. So when do you monitor response to treatment? So for trichomoniasis, Follow-up after treatment is not uh, routinely recommended except when there is recurrence or persistent symptoms. However, in a study by um, Peter Mann et al., um, he, a study noted high rates of reinfection among women treated for trichomoniasis at 17% within three months. Hence, a recommendation of, of CDC is that all sexually active women should be retested within three months after initial treatment, regardless of whether their sexual partners were treated. How should recurrent and persistent trichomoniasis be managed? So metronidazole, 500 milligrams PO, BID for seven days, repeat the same regimen, and if this regimen fails, consider high, I'll give uh, metronidazole at a higher dose at two grams orally for seven days. So treatment protocol for non-response to standard treatment so states that you repeat the course of a stand, seven day standard therapy and if there is failure, uh, increase the dose to two grams OD for five to seven days and if still with failure, do resistance testing. What are the recommended treatment for trichomoniasis in pregnant women? So it's still metronidazole, 500 milligrams orally, BID, for seven days, with an alternative of two grams orally, single dose. So studies have shown increased risk for relapse among those given the single dose as compared to the multiple dose. So what are the recommended treatment for the HIV patient? It's the same. So in a randomized treatment trial uh, by Kissinger et al., so uh, findings of with the use of metronidazole, 500 milligrams BID for seven days, lowered repeat uh, trichomonas vaginalis infection rates at the test of cure and at three months after as compared to metronidazole, two grams single dose. How do you manage sexual partners of patients? So current partners should be referred for presumptive therapy regardless of symptoms or any partner within four weeks prior to presentation. 
avoid intercourse until they and their sexual partners have been adequately treated and any symptoms have resolved. So expert opinion suggests male partners be evaluated and treated with metronidazole, 500 milligrams BID for seven days, the same therapy as recommended for the case. For vulvovaginal candidiasis, what are the recommended treatments? So recommended treatment is fluconazole, 150 milligrams orally single dose for compliance purposes with an alternative of the use of myconazole and clotrimazole, which are locally available. So trials in acute uh, vulvovaginal candidiasis have shown that for intravaginal imidazole and oral azoles, clinical and mycological cure rates were at more than 80%. Intravaginal and oral imidazoles may be equally effective at achieving cure clinical cure of up to 12 weeks. In a Cochrane review uh, on oral versus uh, intravaginal imidazole and triazole uh, antifungal treatment of uncomplicated vulvovaginal candidiasis, findings show that there is no statistically significant difference between oral and intravaginal antifungals as to mycological cure on its short and long-term follow-ups when whether they are administered a single dose treatments or comparing the single dose versus the multiple dose. When do you monitor response to treatment? Follow-up is not required unless symptoms persist or is pregnant, and if pregnant, testing should be repeated after one month to ensure the therapy was effective. So how should recurrent vulvovaginal candidiasis be managed? So there is an induction uh, state, fluconazole given at 150 milligrams per cup every 72 hours for three doses with a maintenance of um, fluconazole, 150 milligrams, once a week for six months. Recurrent vulvovaginal candidiasis is defined as at least four or more episodes of symptomatic, mycologically proven uh, VVC in one year with at least partial resolution of symptoms between episodes with a positive microscopy or a moderate heavy growth of um, uh, candida albicans on at least two occasions when symptomatic. Treatment requires uh, induction to assure clinical remission and usually followed by six month maintenance regimen. So a study by Sobel re uh, revealed, uh, findings revealed that women receiving a maintenance period of fluconazole more likely remain disease-free during and for six months after than those treated with placebo, although most women who received the maintenance regimen had relapsed within a year. The median time to clinical recurrence in the fluconazole group was 10 months as compared to four months in the placebo group. However, failure to initiate a maintenance regimen will result in mycological and clinical relapse of vaginitis in 50% of patients within three months. So what are the recommended treatment for pregnant women? So the recommended are the topical azole therapies usually applied for seven days, and this include clotrimazole and myconazole. Um, no, there is no evidence that one topical imidazole is more effective than another. Oral azole should be avoided in pregnant or lactating women. So what are the recommended treatment for HIV patients? So treatment follows that of non-HIV patients. How do you manage sexual partners of patients with VVC? Treatment of sexual partners is not recommended as there is no evidence to support the treatment of asymptomatic male sexual partners in any of acute, recurrent, or chronic VVC. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone.
So I'll be uh, talking about the treatment of anogenital warts. Uh, these are the members of the technical working group. All right. Uh, before we continue, uh, I'll just take a moment um, to acknowledge the original chair, Dr. Manolito Chua, Infectious Diseases. And we'd just like to thank him for all that he has done and had done for our group for the society and for the field of infectious diseases. I'd like to thank him for the memories and we miss you. So we'll go to the treatment of anogenital warts, okay? Um, first question was, should patients diagnosed with anogenital warts be treated? And the recommendation is treatment should be offered to patients with clinically apparent anogenital warts, including adjacent subclinical lesions, and this is a strong recommendation and low quality of evidence. No. The CDC and the UK guidelines consider it a reasonable option to wait and see if the lesions resolve spontaneously. But the German and our guidelines, so we adopted the German guidelines, strongly recommend treatment since warts are contagious and treating will relieve both the physical and the psychological problems associated with it. Um, and therefore, this is uh, what we came up with. No. So the next part is, the next question is, what are the recommended region, uh, regimens for external anogenital warts? No. So we go on to say that the treatment regimens for external anogenital warts include either patient-applied or provider-administered regimens. And this is all, and uh, this uh, statement is all present in the guidelines that we adopted. No. However, the next recommendation states that the regimen to be chosen should arise after a joint and informed decision by the patient and the physician after considering the following factors, size, number, location of the warts, preference of the patient along with expected treatment adherence, physician expertise and availability of the equipment, underlying comorbidities or conditions, and this is a strong recommendation and high quality of evidence. The German and the UK guidelines stated that the same factors, the, these same factors should be considered and that patients should actually be given a comprehensive uh, information before the patient and the doctor decide. No. So the recommended patient applied regimens for external anogenital warts are imigrimod 5%, Podophylox or podophylotoxin, 0.5% solution, and sinacatechins, 15% ointment. Strong recommendation and high quality of evidence. No? This is based on high quality RCTs, okay? And recurrence rates were actually low for imiquimod and sinacatechins. Imiquimod 3.75% was not included because of uh, its lack of data and it has not been studied extensively. And then comparison of these uh, regimens has been limited. Okay. Now, these, uh, uh, among all three, Imikumod is the one that is uh, more readily available here. Some of our dermatology colleagues uh, bring in some of, uh, of the other um, uh, topicals that uh, they use. Podophylox and semicatakins are not really as available. Now, the recommended provider-administered regimens for external anogenital warts are cryotherapy, surgical removal, and this includes electrosurgery or electrocautery, and trichloroacetic or TCA or bichloroacetic acid, 80 to 90 percent solution. And this is a strong recommendation and high quality of evidence. Okay. Uh, cryotherapy, though, has lower cure rates versus surgery. Uh, including electrosurgery, which their, their cure rate surgery, electrosurgery have cure rates that reach up to 100%, and cryo also has higher relapse rates, you know, although every single one uh, is backed by um, high quality randomized controlled trials, although direct comparison is limited as well, okay? In our guidelines, we also emphasize infection control measures to prevent transmission of HPV to healthcare workers who treat anogenital HPV lesions with laser or electrosurgery. And uh, in the guidelines, we'll place uh, how these uh, um, modalities are used, okay? 
So the next question is, what are recommended regimens for intra-anal warts? Remember, ex those, the previous recommendations were for external. So the recommended primary regimens are electrocautery, laser, curettage, and excision. Okay? This is strong recommendation and low quality of evidence. And for uh, recurring intra-anal warts, the same primary treatment options are also recommended and can be followed after healing by adjuvant imiquimod 5% cream. And this is a strong recommendation, very low quality of evidence. Okay? The German guideline acknowledged that evidence for intra-anal warts is limited and that all the regimens had high recurrence rates. Uh, the approach itself, they said, was not easy because of difficult access, anatomic peculiarities, and the absence of approved medications for mucosal application. Okay. Now, the second line regimens that are recommended uh, for intra-anal warts that can be considered no, are TCA, imiquimod, cryotherapy. No. This is strong recommendation uh, and low quality of evidence. No. The German guideline cited that it was difficult to control the depth uh, when cryotherapy is used, no? and therefore it, it has become second line. And the topical modalities for intra-anal warts are actually off-label, and they are not approved for mucosal application. So the next one is, what are the recommended treatment options for meatal, no? this is the urologic realm, and intraurethral warts? No? Uh, for meatal and intraurethral warts, it's recommended to use surgical or ablative measures like forceps resection, electroresection or coagulation, and laser. No? This is strong recommendation, low quality of evidence. And for intraurethral warts, it is always recommended to use an endourologic procedure and keep open surgery as the last resort. And this is a strong recommendation and low quality of evidence. No? So prospective randomized studies on the above, no, on the, what we presented, are lacking for intramedial and intraurethral warts. No? And this is all based on scattered case reports and observational studies. No? The German and UK guidelines agree that surgically ablative procedures as an option for these conditions are, uh, may be done, although there is a high risk for developing strictures, and therefore only the, those with experience and centers that are equipped uh, should be the ones doing these procedures. Now, the next, our next question was, is there a role for adjunct systemic interventions in the management of anogenital warts? So adjunct meaning either interferon alpha and or simultaneous or adjuvant therapeutic HPV vaccination to improve the efficacy of topical war, uh, agents for the treatment of warts. However, we cannot recommend them at this time. No? And this is a weak recommendation and moderate quality of evidence. No? For interferon, there is meta-analytic and RCT data, uh, but that had contradicting results and high, high risk of bias. No? More importantly, there were many more adverse effects with interferon according to the German guidelines. So now we go to what are the surgical treatment indications and options for anogenital wards? No? Surgical treatment may be the best option for wards or lesions that are large, extensive, multifocal using either laser, electrosurgery, or cautery, or modified coagulation methods. And this is strong recommendation and moderate quality of evidence. Uh, and then curatage and scissor excision are reserved for solitary warts. No? Strong recommendation, moderate quality of evidence. Uh, and then the, for recurrent external anogenital warts, despite treatment with other regimens, treatment with surgical or ablative methods is recommended followed afterwards by, uh, after they heal by topical imiquimod or sinicatakins ointment to reduce chances of further recurrence. And this is strong recommendation and moderate quality of evidence. So the CDC guidelines cited that surgical methods are most beneficial for those that we just mentioned and for cases that did not respond to other modalities. So surgery, 
if, the, if they did not respond to previous regimens, then surgery comes in. No? It may also be done for small numbers of warts as long as they are accessible. Now, the German guideline recommended surgical and ablative methods, particularly forceps resection for meatal warts and endourologic procedures for intraurethral warts. Um, we have local uh, colorectal surgeons with us in the technical working group, and actually what they do uh, in locally is to use TCA instead of imiquimod uh, after surgery for those recurrent types of lesions. No? So next, um, how do you monitor response to treatment of anogenital warts? Okay. Uh, it is recommended that follow-up of uh, patients who receive treatment should be scheduled within three months since most anogenital warts respond during that time frame. No? So if it's going to respond, usually it responds in the first three months. Patients should be regularly seen to evaluate for treatment response and also for treatment side effects, or treatment related side effects while receiving a course of treatment. And this is a strong recommendation for a very low quality of evidence. So while receiving a course of treatment, patients should be regularly seen to evaluate for treatment response and or treatment related side effects. Now, this is a strong recommendation, very low quality of evidence. After treatment, it is recommended that for those with external anogenital warts who are treated for the first time, post-treatment follow-up should be scheduled within the first three months, preferably uh, after four to eight weeks, since most anogenital warts respond during that time frame, and a final examination after an additional three to six months. A strong recommendation, but very low quality of evidence. Now, after treatment, it is recommended that for those with intra-anal this time or intra-urethral warts treated for the first time, post-treatment follow-up examination should be done after four to eight weeks, the same, and every three to six months until the, patients, the patient is recurrence-free for a total of 12 months. No? So a little bit more, uh, it's a little bit more um, close follow-up for them. Now, for those with recurrent anogenital warts, Post-treatment follow-up examinations should be done every three to six months until the patient is recurrence-free for a total of 12 months. Basically similar, no? Strong recommendation and very low quality of evidence. Okay. All right. And then for patients in whom their original lesions are responding to the present treatment, but with note of development of new lesions in those areas that were not treated, no? the present regimen can be continued and just extended to those areas. However, it is recommended that a new treatment modality be used when a patient does not exhibit significant response after a standard treatment course, and usually this is around four to five weeks with most regimens, and in eight to 12 weeks with imiquimod. Remember, imiquimod is given up to 16 weeks. And then patient, when patients experience se severe adverse effects after a specific treatment course, then uh, a new regimen may be done or may be used. And this is strong recommendation, very low quality of evidence. No? And these were all adapted from the CDC and from the German guidelines. Okay. Now we go to the next question. What are the recommended and alternative treatment for special populations? And now we first tackle the pregnant women. No? So although imiquimod appears uh, to, ha to pose low risk, it should be avoided until more data are available in pregnant women. Strong recommendation, low quality of evidence. Although imiquimod appears to pose low risk, um, it should av be avoided until more data are available. No? So strong recommendation and low quality of evidence. No? Still in pregnant women, wart removal may be considered during pregnancy but it is recommended that it be done after pregnancy since treatment response may be suboptimal when done while the patient is pregnant. No? So this is a strong recommendation and low quality of evidence. So cesarean delivery is recommended for pregnant women with anogenital warts if there is pelvic outlet obstruction 
or if there is excessive bleeding with vaginal delivery. And this is a strong recommendation, low quality of evidence. But then, cesarean delivery is not recommended if it will be done solely to prevent transmission of HPV from mother to the newborn. And that's a strong recommendation and moderate quality of evidence. Okay. And therefore, because of that previous recommendation, it's also recommended to counsel pregnant women with anal genital warts that actually there is a low risk of transmission of HPV and the development of warts on the larynx of their children or their infants, including that condition called recurrent respiratory uh, papillomatosis. And this is a strong recommendation, moderate quality of evidence. Still in pregnant women, it is recommended that deciding to treat a pregnant woman with external genital warts before the 34th week should be done with caution, including careful consideration and establishment of the indication to treat them. So there, usually it's, there has to be a strong indication, and this is strong recommendation, high quality of evidence. Okay, so it is, uh, again, this is the same. Um, and una ulit. Okay. Now it is recommended to use cryotherapy, TCA, or surgical ablative procedures in pregnant women with external anogenital warts or intraepithelial neoplasia in whom treatment is indicated. No? So this is a strong recommendation and high quality of evidence. So hindi ganong karami yung, yung uh, treatment options for uh, pregnant women uh, in general. No? And these are from studies from the CDC uh, um, guideline and all the guidelines that we, we got, no? basically the, what they're trying to uh, tell us no, is that we try to avoid treatment unless particularly indicated in that pregnant lady. No? So now we move to the next special population, our people living with HIV. No? First recommendation, it is recommended that management of anal genital warts in PLHIV be the same as those without HIV infection, but with preference to methods that spare the tissue. No? Uh, and the reason for preference to methods that spare the tissue is because there's a higher risk of recurrence, no? and therefore there's the tissue. Whenever you do a procedure, you spare tissue so that in the future, hindi ka maubusan. And the only difference is follow-up, and we shall see that later. And this is strong recommendation, low quality of evidence. So for PLHIV, it is recommended that post-treatment follow-up, and this is what we mentioned just one slide ago, uh, the follow-up examination be lifelong, scheduled every three to six months, because patients with HIV have a higher risk of recurrence of anogenital warts and an elevated risk of cancer, you know, HPV-associated cancer. You know. It is recommended that persons with HIV infection be monitored for and educated about their increased risk to develop anogenital warts. No? So recurrence, and this is difference, this is uh, development naman of anogenital warts, which is higher than those who without HIV. And this is strong recommendation and low quality of evidence. No? So in general, no? uh, then there is the next one pala. No? Nauulit yung slide namin. Ah. Okay. So in general, the treatment is the same. No? Based, and this is based on meta-analytic data, some controlled studies. No? And, but then the, the bottom line is like we adopted what the CDC said, no? that there was no evidence supporting a difference in, in PLHIV treatment from immunocompetence uh, in immunocompetent patients, no? uh, except for the follow-up. And then uh, we already mentioned because of the tendency of relapse, the UK and German guidelines no, um, recommend a more frequent follow-up. No? Now, uh, no, this is not in the recommendations, no, but uh, came up with our uh, meeting with the colorectal surgeons as well, no, that it is the practice of local colorectal surgeons to refer PLHIV with warts to ID specialists for clearance before procedures and at the same time for HIV testing. So we come now to the next uh, special population, and that's the transgender population. No? 
It is recommended that the management of anal genital warts in the transgender population be the same as those without HIV infection. This is a weak recommendation with very low quality of evidence. Actually, none of the guidelines that we assessed to be um, good for adaptation for us uh, did not have any data or any recommendations on transgender. So we will be the first to have it. No? And then how do you manage sexual partners? No? It is recommended that uh, sexual partners of patients with anal genital warts be made aware of their partner's condition because the HPV could have actually been transmitted already despite the absence of gross lesions. Uh, sexual partners should be examined for the presence of anal genital warts using PE or physical exam but not tested for HPV if gross exam is negative, meaning no need for you know, more uh, uh, extensive uh, diagnostics no, if there are no gross lesions. No. And then tested for other non-HPV associated STIs. No. And this is strong recommendation, weak quality of evidence. And, there, and uh, our last recommendation is to notify previous and our future sexual partners of patients who used to have anal genital warts. Um, this one cannot be recommended at this time. And this is a weak recommendation and weak quality evidence, of evidence. No? And these are uh, actually a, a hodgepodge of recommendations that uh, we got that we adapted from the CDC, uh, UK, German guidelines, uh, and then we just took the best and after, after a lot of discussion. And I thank you for your attention. Good afternoon. On behalf of the Urethritis Subcommittee, I will be sharing the recommendations for urethritis and cervicitis. Um, our first question is, uh, what are the recommended treatment for patients with urethritis? Current recommendations are based on pathogen and area infected, and I will be presenting it in this manner. The guidelines we deemed acceptable to create these recommendations include the WHO guidelines, for gonorrhea and chlamydia, the STD guidelines from the CDC, and organism-specific guidelines from Europe and the United Kingdom. So the first question, what is the recommended treatment for genital or anorectal gonococcal infection? Due to the high risk, high rates of resistance to quinolones, emerging azithromycin resistance, and decreased susceptibility to ceftriaxone and cefixim, Good practice dictates that the choice of treatment for genital and anorectal gonorrhea should depend on reliable local data on antimicrobial susceptibility. However, in settings where local resistance data are not available, evidence suggests dual therapy over single therapy. The recommendation is ceftriaxone, 250 milligram intramuscular, as a single dose, plus azithromycin, one gram, as a single dose. Now, intramuscular injection may be less desirable than oral administration based on previous studies done on syphilis. However, cefixim should only be considered as an alternative cephalosporin regimen because it does not provide as high nor as sustained bactericidal blood levels as a 250 milligram dose of cefriaxone. The use of azithromycin as the second antimicrobial is preferred to doxycycline because of the convenience and compliance advantages of single dose therapy and the substantially higher prevalence of gonococcal resistance to tetracycline than to azithromycin. In addition, persons, persons infected with Neisseria gonorrhea frequently are co-infected with chlamydia trichomatis and the regimen that includes azithromycin is may, may be well recommended. Now, for oropharyngeal gonococcal infection. Gonococcal infections of the pharynx are more difficult to eradicate 
than are infections at urogenital and anorectal sites. Few antimicrobial regimens reliably cure more than 90% of infections. And treatment failures are higher in patients with oropharyngeal gonococcal infections. Treatment for these cases should therefore be as aggressive as for anorectal disease. Because of emerging resistance to single therapies and lack of local surveillance data in most regions, dual therapy is favored over single therapy. Cefixim does not provide as high nor as sustained bactericidal blood levels as cefriaxone and only demonstrated a 92.3% cure rate versus a 97.5 cure rate with cefriaxone. Now, if ceftriaxone is not available, a 400 milligram dose of oral cefixim should be considered as an alternative. What about uncomplicated genital chlamydia? For the treatment of uncomplicated genital chlamydia, a single dose of azithromycin and seven days of doxycycline have been found to be equally efficacious for the treatment of genital chlamydial infection with cure rates of 97% and 98% respectively, as reported by a meta-analysis of 12 and 25 randomized control trials. Due to its equivalent efficacy, the choice of whether to use azithromycin is influenced by parsimony, cost, and convenience. When high value is placed on reducing cost, doxycycline in a standard dose may be the best choice. When high value is placed on convenience and assurance of treatment adherence, azithromycin in a single dose may be the best choice. However, concurrent treatment for gonococcal infection should be considered if a patient is at risk for gonorrhea or lives in a community where the prevalence for gonorrhea is high or is part of a key affected population at risk. In this case, use of azithromycin is advised. Alternative treatment with erythromycin and quinolones like levofloxacin and ofloxacin result in fewer cures but less side effects. In our local setting where TB is a concern, we would want to recommend reserving the use of quinolones. Rectal chlamydial infections are rarely tested for and usually it occurs concurrently with genital chlamydia. Treatment of anorectal infections as rectal infection may, may be unknown. Low quality evidence exists from eight non-randomized studies that compared azithromycin and doxycycline for anorectal chlamydia. There may be 200 fewer microbiological cures per 1,000 people with azithromycin compared to doxycycline. There is little to no evidence in side effects. Now let's deal with the rationale behind this um, recommendation. The bioavailability of azithromycin in rectal tissue is less than that observed in urethral or cervical tissue, as shown in animal studies. Human studies report a decreased inflammatory response in the rectum when infected with chlamydia, attenuating azithromycin efficacy. Unlike azithromycin, doxycycline is highly lipid soluble and is rapidly absorbed in rectal tissue and demonstrates concentrations above the MIC for chlamydia. While these results may warrant concern about azithromycin's effectiveness, the quality of evidence included was poor and no randomized controlled trials directly comparing azithromycin with doxycycline were identified. Men who have sex with men who are screened for rectal chlamydia who have a positive result should be asked carefully about the symptoms of proctitis as this may be LGV and may require doxycycline with a longer treatment duration. So in summary, doxycycline may result in more cures as well as being less expensive than azithromycin. Azithromycin is an alternative that may be better accepted by patients due to the single dose treatment. Inasmuch as rectal chlamydia is rarely tested for, it would be parsimonious to recommend a treatment that would coincide with the recommended regimen for genital chlamydia, hence our recommendation. Next, oropharyngeal chlamydia. 
The clinical significance of oropharyngeal chlamydia is unclear and routine screening is not recommended. Available evidence, however, shows that chlamydia can be transmitted to genital sites. Detection of the organism from an oropharyngeal sample calls for the treatment with either azithromycin or doxycycline. The efficacy of treating with alternative treatment regimens remains unknown. Next question. How do you monitor the response to treatment? Patients who complete a recommended or alternative regimen for uncomplicated infection do not need an evaluation for a test of cure. So a test of cure means repeating testing three to four weeks after completing therapy. It is performed to ensure effective eradication. It is not needed for persons treated with a recommended or alternative regimen for uncomplicated urethritis. So when do we do a test of cure? A test of cure is necessary if symptoms are persistent, adherence is in question, reinfection is suspected, or infection is complicated. Um, additionally, pharyngeal gonorrhea, because it is more difficult to cure compared with urethritis and anorectal infections, require a test of cure. Patients with pharyngeal gonorrhea who were treated with an alternative regimen and not the recommended one, so it would touch as cefixim plus azithromycin, should return 14 days after treatment for a test of cure. Test of cure for gonorrhea can be evaluated by a culture with or without simultaneous NAT. All positive cultures with N gonorrhea and any gonococci isolated should be tested for antimicrobial susceptibility. The use of NAT at less than three weeks after completion of therapy is not recommended because of the continued presence of non-viable organisms leading to false positive results. Reinfection rates for gonorrhea in men was reported to be 7% in one meta-analysis, while other studies showed male reinfection rates at 7 to 8% with gonorrhea and 10 to 17% with chlamydia. Reinfection was strongly associated with previous sexually transmitted diseases and younger age and risky behavior. A patient diagnosed with chlamydia or gonorrhea should be instructed to return three months after treatment for repeat testing due to high rates of reinfection, regardless of whether their sex partners were treated. If retesting is not possible in three months, it can be performed on any clinic visit within 12 months of the initial treatment. The next question, how should recurrent and persistent urethritis be managed? If a patient presents with symptoms of urethritis after treatment, the first thing to do is to distinguish reinfection from treatment failure. Suspected reinfection is persistent or recurrent symptoms in a patient who reports interim sexual exposure to untreated or new sex partners. Patients suspected of having a reinfection should be retreated with their recommended antibiotic regimen. Persistence of infection is considered in an adequately treated patient whose risk of reinfection is low. Before retreatment, resistance data should be obtained when possible and treat according to susceptibility. And then the guideline reg recommended regimens ideally should be used. Here's where it gets complicated. And yet the quality for this recommendation is low. So of 34 randomized and non-randomized studies, most studies reported on cases of treatment failure or reinfection. However, a, dis a distinction between the two was not made. Also, cure rates for different drugs were not consistent across the studies. So in summary, there is very low quality evidence for the effects of specific medicines for people who fail treatment. Therefore, the recommendation is based on first determining whether or not the initial treatments was according to the guideline. If not, give the recommended treatment. And then if they were given the guideline recommendation, dual treatment with a double dose is recommended. So written in red are the recommended guidelines and the new regimen recommended. 
the recent studies showing higher treatment failure rates with azithromycin compared to doxycycline have raised concerns about antibiotic resistance. There have been no published cases of isolates with genetic resistance to azithromycin in vivo. Reinfection is common and usually occurs within the first two to five months of the previous reinfection. So for recurrent and persistent non gonococcal urethritis, the recommendation for reinfection or use of a non-recommended regimen is the same as azithromycin, one gram, a single dose, or doxycycline, 100 milligram, twice a day for seven days. For recurrent and persistent non gonococcal urethritis among men who have sex with women, the recommended is metronidazole, two grams, as a single dose, with an alternative tinidazole, two grams, as a single dose. Because trichomonas vaginalis is also known to cause urethritis in men who have sex with women. Men who have sex with women and have persistent or recurrent urethritis should be presumptively treated with this regimen. Their partners should be referred for evaluation and appropriate treatment. Recent studies have shown that most common cause of persistent or recurrent non gonococcal urethritis is mycoplasma genitalium, especially following doxycycline therapy. Azithromycin one gram orally in a single dose should be administered to men initially treated with doxycycline. Certain observational studies have shown that moxifloxacin 400 milligram orally once daily for seven days is highly effective for mycoplasma genitalium, hence given to M men who fail a regimen of azithromycin. Testing for M genitalium is essential to guide treatment. Although urologic investigation is usually normal, unless the patient has urinary flow problems, a referral to urology can be considered for persistent urethritis despite retreatment. A test of cure after retreatment at relevant clinical sites should be obtained 7 to 14 days after completing retreatment. Culture is the recommended test, preferably with a simultaneous NAAT and antimicrobial susceptibility testing of Neisseria gonorrhea. Clinicians should ensure partner evaluation, which I'll talk about in a little while. For special populations, what are the treatment recommendations? So for people living with HIV, they shall receive the same treatment regimen as those who are HIV negative. For pregnant women who have gonorrhea, the quality of evidence for the effects of treatment for genital and anorectal gonococcal infections in pregnant women is low. Evidence was reviewed from three studies, including two randomized and one non-randomized study. When data for pregnant women was not available, evidence in non-pregnant adults was used to inform the recommendations. So treatment for gonorrhea and pregnant is the same as in non-pregnant. Chlamydia in pregnancy. The recommendation is azithromycin, one gram per RM as a single dose. Take note that quinolones and doxycycline are contraindicated in pregnancy. So our alternative is amoxicillin, 500 milligram per RM, thrice a day for seven days, over erythromycin, 500 milligram, four times a day for seven days. Managing sexual partners. So all sexual partners within 60 days prior to onset of symptoms should receive evaluation, testing, and presumptive dual treatment. If it has been more than 60 days since the last sexual encounter, the most recent sexual partner should be treated. Your patient should be advised to abstain seven days after the last day of treatment to prevent reinfection. We mentioned presumptive treatment of sexual partners. For, so for gonorrhea, whose partners are at risk, the recommendation is the same. For chlamydia, especially for women at risk, especially for those who are going to be preg are at risk of pregnancy as well, and the partners for women of women with an existing PID, the recommendation is either azithromycin or doxycycline. Going to the last round of my last slide, 
For um, how do you manage adverse reactions and intolerance? The use of such triaxone as is contraindicated in persons with a history of an IgE-mediated penicillin allergy. Example, anaphylaxis, SJS, and 10. Data are quite limited regarding alternative regimens for treating gonorrhea among persons who have either a cephalosporin or an IgE-mediated penicillin allergy. So for those with cephalosporin allergy, the recommendation is gentamicin, 240 milligram IM plus azithromycin, two grams as a single dose. For those with azithromycin, the recommendation is doxycycline, 100 milligram per RM BID for seven days with the ceftriaxone or cefixin. And with that, uh, the Urethritis Subcommittee thanks you and I'd like to acknowledge our group members in the room. Thank you. Okay, we'd like to thank the four presenters. Again, can we give them a big applause?